Hey everyone, it's Jason. Uh, so today I'm going to do a, um, yo, know, component video of um, Boss Monster. Um, I've already unboxed. I've had this thing for quite a while. Um, I've had a couple of expansions. Um, I just got a bunch more, uh, because the new Overboss, uh, new, like, uh, it's different. It's a game based around this. Um, and I'll do a video on that too. Uh, but I realized when I was waiting for it, and I was like, oh, I'll make a gameplay video, which, um, you know, you may have already watched, because it was out a little bit before this. Um, I realized I hadn't done unboxings for any of these games. Um, and I think I probably thought I did, because I remember sitting down one day, going through all these cards, like, oh yeah, this card, this card. And then I realized I was just sitting on my couch doing that, and I didn't actually make videos. So, now that I got all the expansions that are currently out, uh, with the exception of a few, like, Kickstarter exclusive stuff, um, I'm going to do a bunch, series of videos for them. So we're going to start off with the, the OG game, the Boss Monster. So if you're not familiar with what this is, um, is you're playing a boss in essentially like an uh, 8-bit, 16-bit game world. That's what it's supposed to be like. Um, thinking like uh, probably like a Mario Brothers game, like if you're Bowser or like Samus in Metroid. Um... Or like Castlevania, uh, it's like a side scroller, and you're playing as the boss, and you are creating a dungeon that heroes are going to try and go through, and either because they want to defeat the boss, or they want to try and get the treasure, um, or whatever they want to do. Um, for whatever reason, they try and enter a dungeon, and you're trying to build a dungeon to stop them, and then you're competing against other players who are also playing bosses, creating their own dungeons, and. Um, they're creating their own dungeons, and then they're trying to, based on what dungeons you play, they do different damage, different abilities. There's, um, it will kind of go through some of that. Um, and they're trying to lure them in. Um, I'm not going to go over, like, super thorough into the gameplay of it. Um, I'll do a separate video. I kind of did in my gameplay video, but I think I'm going to maybe do a better version than I did of that. I don't think I explained it super well in there. Uh, but let's just go over the instruction book like I always do. Um, and you can see it's, like, the cover art looks like an old NES-type game. You're like, oh, here's, like, the Nintendo logo by Brother Wise Games. Here's how many players it is. Um, even the instruction book where it's kind of, like, pixelated. Uh, we're only where it needs to be. They didn't go, like, overboard. Uh, this is an introduction, uh, from the Brother Wise, and that's their character, which they finally get a card in one of the later expansions. Um, so how it plays, the objective of the game is each player uh, wins if they get 10 souls. Um, so they get a soul 1 or 2, depending on what type of hero they defeat. Or if they gain 5 wounds, they should get 1 or 2 if the hero gets to their dungeon. Uh, the game plays fairly simple. You have your boss monster over here. You play dungeons in front of it. You can play regular dungeons, monster dungeons, advanced dungeons. Um, and then you keep your scores over here so you can keep track. Every turn, you get play on one new dungeon card. Um, so you have different information on here. And I'll kind of look over this as we go through. But you have your boss monsters. Uh, there's a bunch of different ones to choose from. So it's not like some games where you get like five types. It's like, nope, I think there's two or, th what is this one? There's three of each different class. So there's some good options. There's different room types. Um, like I said, monster types. There's advanced types. There's trap types. Um, plus each one has a different uh, treasure on the bottom. Uh, they have damage costs. And we'll kind of go over that a little quick. They have some different heroes. Those are the four different types of cards, and the fifth kind is the spell cards, uh, which can only be played during certain parts, either during the attack phase or the build phase. Uh, here's kind of setup, and here's how the board will end up looking. So, like, you have your boss, you'll play your rooms. You can only play up to five rooms. Uh, another player plays there. This is up to a four-player game, um, and then when you buy some of the later expansions, you can up it to a six player, five- or six-player game. Um, but yeah, it's really fun. Again, check out the gameplay video. So, the turns are fairly simple. Beginning of the turn, build phase, bait phase, adventure phase, end of the turn. Um, 
basically the beginning of the card. You show what heroes are going to be are getting ready to enter, enter the village, getting ready to go to the dungeons. And then that way, and then each player draws a room card. And then you start your build phase. And now, because you know what heroes are trying to go there, you can adjust your dungeon to be like, all right, I have enough cards that this hero is going to come to my dungeon, um, but can I defeat him? Because maybe you're like, oh, I don't have enough attack power to defeat this guy, so you're going to send him to a different... So maybe you might uh, get rid of one of your rooms or cover up one of your rooms so that you don't have it. Uh, so you don't have to bring him in there because what's the point of inviting him in for defeat? Um, this is kind of explaining how the build works. Bait phase. A little bit more on that. It's, it's a very good instruction book. Um, adventure phase. End of turn phase. Some player variants. Good glossary explaining what different stuff does. Uh, and then all the credits. Alright, I didn't want to spend too much time on this. Here's another quick sequence of play. Uh, and then even on top of that, then they also come with this nice little quick start guard. Your quick setup. Beginning of your turn, what you do in your build phase, bait phase, adventure, end your turn, spells, and timing. So, they give you a, a quick one on the back. Another quick sheet just has, like, a little longer quick sheet. Um, but they get you right in there. Uh, so let's hop in. One of the great things about this game is because it's based off of, like, uh, old video game stuff. Is the art's all kind of pixely. And on top of that, there's a lot of references. And not just references to other old school games, there's references to newer games and other pop culture things. Um, and even, I'm sure, probably some of the newer expansions, which I haven't looked at yet, because I just got them, have even more stuff. So here we're going to start off with one of our bosses. And it's going to have a little boss symbol at the top. This is Draculord, the hypnotic vampire. Clearly like Dra Dracula. I mean, it could be the Castlevania one. could be a different one. Um, all the bo bosses have XP on the bottom. This is just showing their experience with these for, like, tie-breaking effects. Um, so, or, like, player or player turn or so whichever monster has the highest XP takes the first turn when it comes to taking turn stuff. Uh, it's like when you have to do your attack phase, the highest monster character gets to go first, um, and so forth. And then they have a treasure symbol in the bottom. Which is also on all the room cards. And this is the one that's going to attract certain heroes. So the Dracula is going to attract clerics more often. Um, and then all the bosses also have a level up ability. Um, and I'm not going to sit... Uh, yeah, I'll probably sit here and read them all. So this will be a little bit longer video. There's a lot of cards. Uh, but how the level up ability works is as soon as you've played your fifth room um, in your dungeon. And it's re your fifth room is revealed... Uh, you get your level up ability. And you have to use it at that time. So you're going to want to plan. You might want to sit at four rooms for a while. Just for the sake of maybe you don't need your ability. Or it's not as beneficial right now. Uh, but like Draculords is. Target opponent reveals his or her hand to you. You take one card and put it into your hand. So stealing someone else's card. That could definitely be helpful. I mean get you more things. Limit their options. Um, the next cleric boss is. Uh, what? Exax? I'm not, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Zizax? The progen progenitator? I'm, I'm pronouncing that wrong too, and I know I am. Um, Lich. He's a, he's a Lich skeleton. Um, so he has less XP than Draculord. Um, so level up. Choose two cards from the discard pile and put them into your hand. I guess we only have two of each in this set. Uh, then we get to the fighter type. So now we have King Croak, Sultan of the Sewers. Uh, so I believe this is more of the uh, Metroid reference to Crag, I believe is his name. And I'm going to get lots of these references wrong. Um, I'm going to try and get them right, but I probably won't. Um, so he is uh, a giant like toad, toad type lizard. Uh, search the room for a deck or discard. Search, search the room deck or discard pile for an advanced monster room. You may immediately build the room over a treasure room with a matching treasure type. And I'll explain that when we get to those types. Um, it's, it's either that or it's based off of just like in general like Bowser or 
um, like KR Rule from Donkey Kong, or it could be the Toad boss from Mario Brothers 2, which I can't remember his name right now. But there's various things. It's not always 100% off of one guy. Here we got Robobo, um, who is a angry golem, or golem. Level up. Each opponent must choose to destroy one room in his or her dungeon. Um, so this guy is clearly based off of uh, Bobobo, Bobo from the... Crap, why double dragon series? That's what we're looking for. Uh, but he's a robot version, which is funny. Uh, so now we have some mage class, which is the book. We have Cerebellus, the father brain, which is based off of Metroid and uh, the Metroid, which is the mother brain. Uh, level up, you may draw three spell cards and then discard a spell card. So, what makes this super powerful is every turn you draw a room card, um, but you start the game with only two spell cards. Um, so the only way to get more spell cards is by having various rooms or effects that give you more spell cards. Uh, because they are pretty powerful, which makes sense. So that's really helpful for that. Uh, we have Segusia, the Sorceress of Sexiness. Um, I'm not sure if she's based off any particular thing. Uh, not that I know of, but you may search through your, through town or the hero decks, choose one hero and put it at the entrance of your dungeon. So basically, you pick a hero you know you can beat and put them in your, um, put them into your dungeon so you can fight them, um, which is really nice. Or it helps you could even steal, um, steal something you know one of your opponents could take. Like maybe they have a lot of fighter spots and you didn't play as many fighter dungeons, so they're gonna get the fighters gonna be attracted to their dungeon. You could steal them to yours and get the free kill over it. Um, and then we have some thieves. Uh, so Cleopatra, the mother of mummies. Uh, fairly explanatory there. It looks like the mummy, Cleopatra. Search the room deck or discard pile for an advanced trap room. You may immediately build it. And then we have Gorgana, queen of the Medusa. Um, choose a hero in town. Immediately kill that hero and place it face down your scorekeeping area. And you see turning them to stone. So those are our eight monsters to start with, all right? Bosses, and they're gonna have green backs here to just help differentiate them from the rest of the the cards. Then we're gonna look at our rooms. All right. So what we're gonna do is they're they're all sorted out as I had, I put them in uh, numerical order. They have a little number way down here in the bottom. It's harder to read on this second older than the newer ones. But they got little symbols in the top. They're going to show up as a trap or a monster. Um, and effectively, they do the same thing. They do just different things. Um, for the most of the part, there's nothing different. Every time you build a room, as long as it's a regular trap or monster room, you can build it on top of another trap or monster room of any type. Um, and again, there's stuff because maybe it has a one-time effect uh, or one health. Like that's all you have, or just does how much damage it does. This does one damage, and maybe later you want to play one that does two damage on top of it, um, or add more symbols, get rid of more symbols. Um, it's it's very interesting on how it works because there's not really a hundred percent. Oh, you should do this because again, you might decide I have two clerics here, and you might be like. Well, I can't beat the cleric that's in town, and I don't want to take the damage. You might cover this card up with a fighter card, so that you don't draw that card. Um, other times, you might be like, oh, I need to play more crosses. You know, clerics, you might play the cleric on top of the fighter card, so that you gain more. So that way, you have two more clerics, and you draw a cleric to you. Um, so you're going to be... So it's the idea of not just playing a room and it just stays there. You might cover them up. And that makes some hard choices because some have ongoing effects. Some have uh, active effects like this one, which is destroy this room. Choose one card from the discard pile and put it in your hand. Um, and then other ones have uh, one-time use effects. So one-time use are easier to want to cover up. Um, but it depends on what their symbols are. So here I have a dark altar. And then lots of these are just multiple cards. 
We have Open Grave, which is also a trap room. And then now you can imagine these, like, in a row. So, like, your hero is anchoring from this side. Let's just grab a hero quick. Let's look at a hero. So, if this was currently my room, I would be bringing this cleric in here. And then this cleric has four hit points, and this dungeon is going to do one damage and two damage. So, it's basically going to come to this dungeon and go boop -a boop boop Take one damage here, take two damage here, and you'd survive this room, and you would take one point of damage. If you were able to beat him, you would flip him over and you'd get one soul. And then that's how you can do that. Um, and we'll look at some more of what the hero does. But it's also neat just because, like, how the rooms lay out together. Like, so you can kind of see how they focus to, like, build kind of like the dungeon that a hero would crawl through. Alright, um, okay, let's get back to looking at more cards. So I have Open Grave. Once per turn, if a hero dies in this room, choose one room from the discard pile and put it in your hand. So a card like this is nice to not have right in the beginning usually, but put later on in your dungeon. Um, or one of your first dungeon cards you would lay down. Because in that way, as you get farther through the dungeon, they're going to have less uh, hit points. And they'll more, more than likely die in here. If it's your very first card, you're probably not going to die very often. Uh, we have a monster room. So you have Spectre's Sanctum. Uh, when you build this room, choose an opponent. That opponent discards a random spell card. So, like, this is cost two, so it's, it's a little bit higher than uh, maybe some of the other ones. But it has um, a one-time effect. So you might want to cover this up with something after you've played it when you can get a higher attack or a better or even a same same number of damage but maybe a different symbol. Uh, just because you can't use the effect anymore. Uh, but making your opponent discard a spell card can be very powerful. We got three of them. We have a Succubus Spa. Uh, once per turn if a hero dies in this room choose an opponent, take a random room or spell card from that opponent's hand. So again, these are really powerful. And they say once per turn because um, there are potentials. Uh, when you're playing, if you're playing, for every player there is, a hero from the deck enters a village. If you're playing a two-player game, you're going to have two heroes every turn. If you're playing a four-player game, it's always going to be four heroes. Depending on what their symbols are, um, or how things are lining up. You might draw anything from zero to all four or possibly more. Uh, because if each, if all the players tie for the same number of symbols, uh, so like, again, let's just say if there's a fighter and each player only has one fighter symbol, the fighter will not enter a dungeon. Um, so therefore he might sit there. And then the next turn comes on, you drew another fighter. If he's still, no one's still played any more fire cards, he's going to sit there. Then in the third turn, one of you plays a, only a fighter and the other one doesn't. Now you have two. You're going to get all them fighters coming to your dungeon. Um, so they're going to enter one at a time, but you're only going to just get this effect once if they die. So if like, they all keep dying on the same spot, you're not going to get this effect multiple times. Um, yeah, cause I, I did go gameplay video, so you can kind of see how some of that works. Because I had a mage, who was like one of the first heroes I drew. He sat in there almost the entire game. Uh, so now we have what's called the advanced monster room. And then there are advanced trap rooms. Although I don't have one for the clerics. Um, and they're gold. Um, the only difference between these and the other things is an advanced card has to be played on the same type of room, so advanced monster has to be on a monster room, and it also has to match the symbol type. So, normally I can play any any card on any other different card. I can play a cleric on a hero, a hero, or a cleric on a, a fighter, a fighter on a thief, a monster on a trap, trap on a monster, doesn't matter. Until you get to the advanced rooms, then they have to be on the specific matching types. Um, and this makes it that much more difficult to play these cards because you have to plan ahead. Um, but they're also a lot more powerful because you can see they're up to level 3 damage. 
and it says once per turn you may discard two room cards to choose one room card from your discard pile and put it in your hand so the Draco which helps you uh, form your rooms better we got two of those and then we have the vampire bordello uh, once per turn if a hero dies in this room you may heal one wound flip over and this is actually cool because it's just flip over one face up hero adding its soul to your value so not only do you heal um, you also actually gain a point towards winning. So that's actually a really cool room. Um, Alright, so that was our cleric rooms. Let's look at our fighter rooms. So here we have a monster room. Goblin army starts with two. Um, monsters in this... Monster rooms adjacent to this have plus one damage. So this is a good one to play like in the middle of your dungeon. Again, if you can plan it right. Um... Now, in this set, they have some of these at the set number. Uh, so this is 15A. Um, the other sets, like I was going through, uh, the other sets I have, they got rid of the A's and B's. But what it is, is because some of these cards have alternate artwork on additional cards. Um, so here we have an A, A, and we have a B. And this is a very subtle one. It's basically just this goblin moved over a little bit. But they, they have some of these that are a lot more drastic, like a before and after, or it's showing uh, a monster moving from A to B. Um, and it's a really neat, just a little addition. I think they got more of it into the later expansions. Like this one, I think they just played around with it here and there. But they did it more like in the second one. Otherwise, the effects and everything are the same. It's the same room, otherwise. Here we have a Golem Factory. Uh, once per turn, if a hero dies in this room, draw a room card. Um, and that is a Billy or Jimmy Lee looking golem, uh, which goes with the Robobo boss monster card, uh, also from Double Dragon. Um, so this is another, this is a good example of being different artwork. So if Minotaur's Maze, uh, who has zero attack, um, doesn't do any damage. Which says, the first time a hero enters this room, send it back to the previous room. So what that means is if I had these two cards next to each other, um, the hero would enter the golem factory, take two damage, then enter the Minotaur's maze, get confused, go back to the golem factory, take two more damage, so now it would be four, and if it happened to die there, then you'd get that effect, and then it would go back to the Minotaur's room, take zero again, and then keep going. Um... So that's definitely, yeah, it's one of these cards where it works better if you play it earlier or depending on what you play around it. So your dungeon management does make sense. It's not just about, oh, I gotta play eight damage down. No, you gotta play them in orders, certain order, certain ways. So here's the alternate art version of that where he actually puts a map up. <laughs> you are here. Um, so that's pretty funny. I like that. Uh, we have the Neanderthal Cave. You cannot build an advanced room on Neanderthal Cave. So it does three. It's pretty powerful on its own, but you can't build any any advanced room on top of it. Uh, you can still replace it if you decide you don't want it for some reason. We have the advanced room Beast Menagerie. Uh, once per turn, when you build another monster room, draw a room card. So this one really... Uh, wants you to build more monster rooms and that's four damage we got two of those and then finally we have the monsters ballroom advanced room uh this room damage this room's damage is equal to the number of monster rooms in your dungeon so this gets a lot better for doing monsters uh, and what's nice is because it doesn't have to be like these cards that affect the monster rooms they don't have to be um, fighter rooms, although the fighters, you know, obviously have lots of benefits because this one gets more powerful. This one, every time you play a monster, you draw a card. Um, and then, like, this one gets plus one for each adjacent monster room you have. Um, so definitely they work well with each other. Uh, but you could play any, any other of the monster rooms, the clerics, the thieves. They're still going to gain those bonuses. Alright, so that's our fighters. And now we're going to get into our mages. Alright, so we have Brain Sucker Hive. So these are our uh, pseudo-metroids. 
uh, once per turn, if a hero dies in this room, maybe draw a spell card. So you've had a couple of different things that happen when uh, heroes die in certain rooms. Um, and depending on how it's set up, it works out in my uh, playthrough video. They kept dying in my golden factory over and over in my one in my uh that player had just a huge hand because they kept gaining cards every turn and then it worked well because i also had another card um in here so i'll show you in a minute it really helped work with that so here's our brain sucker hives and then we get a third one with alternate art where uh they moved up and down and kind of changed color just subtle little things uh we have a dark laboratory trap room when you build this room, draw two spell cards and discard a spell. And that can be, and spell cards when you get those. You'll see like, some are very beneficial, but it might be more or less beneficial depending on how well you built your room or what your opponent's doing. Uh, we have a haunted library trap room, like uh, Ghostbusters. At the beginning of your turn, you may draw from the spell deck instead of the room deck. So this is the other card I had combined with my Golem Factory. So heroes kept dying in my Golem Factory, which me draw an extra room card. So then at the beginning of my turn, I didn't need to draw more room cards. So I was able to keep drawing spell cards, which gave me a huge advantage. Um, but it was just a lucky coincidence that the heroes all just kept dying in that room. Um, and you can kind of set that up, being like there's a lot of heroes that have like, uh, it's like four, six, eight health. Um, in this set, and I'm, I'm hoping I have to double check. I'm thinking the second set they go odd numbers just to offset that, but I'm not for sure. But if you know a lot of them all have four, and that room has two, all I do is put a room with two in front of it and just kind of leave it alone. Um, and it worked really well. And then there's the alternate art for that. Books are in a little bit different position. Ghost is moved. Uh, which is kitchen. Once per turn, you may discard a monster room and draw a spell card. So again, that would work very well with that other one as well. And we got a couple of those. We have some advanced ones. We have the all-seeing eye advanced trap room. Uh, once per turn, when an opponent plays a spell, you may discard a spell card to cancel its effect. So the mages are all about building up them spell cards. And then the last one we have for the mages are the Liger's Den, the Advanced Monster Room. Once per turn, when you play a spell card, draw a spell card. Basically, keep refueling your hand. All right, we got to get. Now we gotta go to the thief. Um, and then one of the later sets um, adds another L, another treasure type, um, and we'll get to that when we get to that set. Uh, so we have. Bottomless pit trap room. Uh, destroy this room. Kill a hero in this room. So, like, the fighters were all about power. The mage rooms were all about magic. The clerics were all about kind of. I guess they were kind of about, like, taking your opponent's cards or messing with their hand. The thief rooms are all about uh, traps and destroying stuff. So, you can destroy this room to kill a hero in this room. So, basically, they're trying to jump to grab this. And you'd be like, oh, that line snapped. Um, here we have the boulder ramp. Destroy another room in your dungeon to deal five damage to a hero in this room. So that lets you do a quick one-time effect to gain an extra five damage. Um, now, just to clarify this, is if I'm playing these two together, um, I can't use this effect to destroy this room to get this effect. That's not how it works. If you destroy a room, you gain the effect uh, from that card, not from the additional effect. So either I can destroy this one to gain, just to straight up kill this room, kill the hero, or I could use destroy bottomless pit per boulder ramps effect to gain plus five to deal damage. Um, and arguably, if you're going to destroy one anyhow, you may as well destroy the one that's just going to straight up kill them rather than giving them 5 HP just because, or 5 damage, because for whatever reason that 5 damage might not take them out. So there we have our boulder ramp. We have the Dizzy Gas Hallway. I was pronouncing that weird. I didn't realize it was Dizzy Gas. I kept saying Dizzy Gas. 
I can't pronounce it with some weird word, but dizzy gas. And it makes sense. If the next room in your dungeon is a trap, it has plus two. So this one works better if you play it later. So if I played it in front of one of these other two, it gave them, gave them, give them an extra bonus. And then we have uh, a th second alternate, or an alternate art for that one. Just shows it like crystallizing or spreading out. We have the jackpot stash. Uh, destroy this room. Double the treasure value of your dungeon's rooms until the end of turn. So basically I could get rid of this and not count my uh, two treasure chests here, but I can double everything else to draw more heroes in that way. Uh, it's just kind of like a gamble. And then we have the recycling center, the advanced trap room. You can see there haven't been any monster rooms in here yet. Uh, where I think the fighter was all monsters, and I think the cleric and mage were like half and half. Um, so recycling center. When another dungeon, in, when another room in your dungeon is destroyed, you may draw two room cards. So this one works really well with all those other effects. Uh, so you get this out on top of one of the other ones, and you can start destroying them, and at least you get replacements. And then we have the Crushinator. Destroy another room in your dungeon until the end of your turn. Your rooms have plus two. So this again boosts everything up by just sacrificing another room. Um, yeah, so it's different flavor, different effects. That's really cool. The last room type we have are gold rooms. Uh, gold rooms are multi-class or multi-treasure. So this is a fighter mage. So this helps you draw more cards in because you have different you have different types. And if you're going to build an advanced room, you can build it to match either symbol. It doesn't have to match both. Uh, but yeah, they definitely help help you get more things out, get more different symbols out quicker. Um, so you have centipede tunnel. When you build when you build this room, you may swap the placement of two rooms in any one dungeon. Um, and that can be very, very good in multiple ways. Some of them rooms that say like the next room gets this, that can mess with that effect in somebody else's room or help you set that up better. Um, alternatively, if you have like a pull, like a three damage room, like at the end of your dungeon by your, by your monster, you can move it to the front um, or move your opponents back. So it takes the hero longer to get to that high damage or they hit that high damage right away. Um, so that could definitely help. So that's kind of a neat one. Uh, construction zone. These little dino characters. who show up on a bunch more cards later. Um, trap room. When you build this room, you may immediately build an additional room. So that's kind of cool. Like you play it and then you build a second room immediately. And I would assume you could build it on top of this one if you want. Which might be the ideal. Um, although that's kind of a waste of a turn. If you could do that, why not just build another one? Unless you're building an advanced room on top of it. We have the Dragon Hatchery, which has no damage. But it contains all four treasure types. Um, and there's a Black Dragon, a Gold Dragon, and a Green Dragon. We got a couple of those. So that just helps draw people in quicker. Uh, but then you can always, after you build up your dungeon a bit, you can get rid of it. The Mimic Vault. When you build this room, choose one ordinary hero in your town and place it at the entrance of your dungeon. Um, an ordinary hero is just not an epic hero. Um, epic heroes are smart enough to not to know what a mimic is. Um, so yeah, you basically can pick, choose someone to bring to your to your, your uh, dungeon. Uh, the Monstrous Monument. When you build this room, choose one monster room from your discard pile and put it in your hand. What's nice about these when you build build rooms is that um, now the effect is over. And if you don't need these symbols right away, you can always build over these again. Or when you don't need them. Torture Chamber. Destroy this room. Choose an opponent. That opponent discards a random room card. Um. And then, Zombie Prison, Monster Room. Destroy this room, choose a dead hero in an opponent's scorekeeping area, send it back to the entrance of that player's dungeon. Um, 
And I might think, well, if they beat it last time, can they beat it this time? Well, maybe they had a magic spell that boosted something, or they sacrificed a card, uh, a room to do an extra bonus effect that you're crushing it, or, um, or that uh, boulder to, like, get extra five. Um, so they might have done something to boost up, you can send it back, and now they can't do that again, or they have to sacrifice something else to be able to take them out. Um, so that's definitely a good reason to do those. Or maybe at that time they were able to just because, you know, or maybe now at this time you, you have a card, like you send it back and then you have a card to boost or decrease something in their dungeon or their hero to hurt them. Um, one other quick thing to note just about the building is when you go to build, um, all players simultaneously, well, all players put their cards face down and then once everyone's played it, um, it's supposed to go in boss XP order, but I think ultimately it, I don't think generally it's going to make that big of a difference, um, when you reveal them. It might have to do for effects though. Just because you have a build thing. Like, build this, it gives each person a chance to do it. But then you reveal them all at the same time. And that way, you don't know. So if you know, like, in the village, there's, uh, um, you know, you, there's a mage and a cleric. So you're going to play the zombie prison because you're like, oh, that'll help me draw them in. Um, you don't know if your opponent is going to play more things like, Okay, I'm going to play another mage to help draw the mages in. Or, hey, I already have three mages. I'm currently winning. Or have have the more mages. I don't need to play anymore. So you don't know what your opponents are building until they flip it over. So you're sh you can come up with a great strategy of being, I'm going to play this and do this. And then draw these guys in. Then your opponent can play something that messes you up because it makes you discard something or destroy something or does this or that um and that's what makes that really fun because you don't know what's going to happen all right so now we have our spell cards uh spell cards are kind of like little scrolls they're gonna have a spell picture on the back so they look different so even when they're in your hand uh your opponent should be able to tell if you have a spell card or a boss or a, or a room room card because they're gonna have different backs and that's fine they don't need to be mixed because that way your opponent can also look at you and be like, "All right, they have three spell cards, so they might be able, they might possibly be able to affect something on my turn." Whereas they can look like, "Oh, they have no spell cards. They can only do what's probably on the table." Um, and then spell cards are gonna have little symbols on the bottom. The little axes are gonna show that it is for the attack phase. So this is when the hero actually enters a dungeon. It's something you can do either to affect your dungeon or to affect your opponent's dungeons on their turn. Some of them will have both symbols. And then some will have... I can't find one because of course I can't. Well, some will have just the little hammer symbol on this side, uh, which is the build phase. Which means it can only be done while things are being built. Um... And then after that build phase ends, you can't do anything. So here we have the Annihilator. So it's going to say give one trap room plus three damage till the end of turn. So you clearly probably don't ever want to play this on your opponent. But it'll help you out during yours. And then this has alternate art. This guy uh, turns around and that other guy's dead. He walked by this thing or something and it killed him. We have the Assassins, based off Assassin's Creed. Uh, choose a hero in your opponent's dungeon. Give that hero plus three heart till the end of turn. So this so you know, what, but uh, beef up your, uh, the heroes entering your opponent's dungeon. So that they're that much harder to take out. Again, that works well with that, like, zombie card. Um, or something like that. Because you could bring something back and then boost them up. We have caving. Destroy a room in your dungeon. Kill any hero in that room. So it's kind of like that one, uh, one trap in the thief set, but it lets you do it for any card. And then there's the alternate picture. She gets crushed. We have counter spell, which is a Harry Potter reference there. Uh, 
So choose a spell card that has just been declared. Cancel the effect of that spell card. So if someone else plays something, you can stop it. So whether they're playing something to benefit themselves, um, and you want to stop it, or they're playing something to hurt you. Exhaustion. Deal X damage to one here in your dungeon, where X is equal to the number of rooms in your dungeon. So that can be anywhere from 1 to 5. So, it could be good, could be bad, depending on where you're at. Uh, fear. Choose a hero in any dungeon, send it back to town. So this could be helpful for you. If um, you can't defeat the hero, like you count up, they have 10 health and you can only do 8 damage. You have nothing to boost it. You can send them back and at least you don't have to deal from this turn. Or alternatively, use it on your opponents and be like, hey, they can beat this, you know, level, they can beat this guy that's 4 four health really easy. Um, you can send it back and at least give you, like, maybe they'll get it next turn, but give you one more turn. Maybe give you a chance to play something to bribe them to your dungeon during your turn. Um, we have Freeze, which just is, looks like metroid -y. Uh, looks like a Freeze Beam. Choose and deactivate one room in any dungeon. It has no damage, treasure, or abilities till the end of turn. Uh, this is a very useful card. Because it can let, stop them from playing effects and maybe boost up another room. Um, or you can... Keep them from playing something like sacrifices to destroy a dungeon. Um, anything like that. Uh, also just if they have like something that's like 3 or 4 damage. You can stop that from happening. So that stuff's all super helpful. Um, or alternatively. You could turn off one of yours or one of your opponent's treasure symbols. To help the bribe go bribing the hero the other direction. Uh, so it's very versatile. And they try to give you 4 of them. It's a very good card. Uh, now we have a giant size. Make my mushroom grow. Sorry, uh, Power Ranger reference. Uh, give one monster room plus three. So we had one that gave trap rooms. Now we have one that gives monster rooms. We have Jeopardy with an evil devil looking Alex Trebek. All players must discard their hands and draw one spell and two room cards. Um... Not really sure what this has to do with Jeopardy, per se. Um, but it does bounce everybody back out, which is kind of nice. Uh, so, like in my gameplay video, uh, my one player kept drawing room cards after room cards because of the golem. And then the other magic room kept giving them extra spells every turn. Uh, and the other player was getting, had to discard stuff. So they're getting down to, like, two or three cards. If they would have had this, that would have evened the game back out right there. Uh, which would have gave them a better chance at winning. So I do like that. It's a neat, neat card. Uh, here I have another Cobalt Strike. Uh, fair wages now. No room can be built this turn. Any face down room is returned to its owner's hand. So this can be like your, there's the build base. So if your opponent plays a card and you're like, I have nothing to play this turn. Or um, maybe you're like, I'm satisfied with what I have, but I don't want to risk them messing me up. You could just stop anything from being played. Motivation. If you have fewer rooms than opponents, than an opponent, you may build an extra room this turn. You must declare this before any rooms are revealed. Uh, so you have to wait until the rooms are, so you can't do it right away. In case they have something that maybe says, when this comes into play, this happens, this happens. Um, or you can't wait to see what they have first. Uh, princess in Peril. Because of course what would a dungeon be without a princess? Choose one hero in town. Place at the entrance of your dungeon. Basically pick your hero you want to fight. Uh, we have Soul Harvest. Choose a face down hero in your scorekeeping area. Remove it from the game. Draw two spell cards. So you can sacrifice one of your wing, wing points. Uh, to get some spells to help you there. It's nice you can play it in your build phase. And that gives you two ups there. Or you could play it during your attack phase. Um, and gain some spells there. Uh, ooh, I like this one's funny art. Uh, teleportation using the portal gun. Uh, send a hero from your dungeon back to the first room of your dungeon. It continues to move through your dungeon. 
So once it gets as far as it can go, you can send them all the way back to the beginning and have to retake all that damage. Um, and here's the second one of that. Oh, look where he teleported right into those spikes. That's just, I love that. It's hilarious. I, that's why I like some of these artworks. Uh, trepidation. Choose a player with, the, with at least two more souls than you. No heroes enter that player's dungeon this turn. Any heroes remaining remain at the entrance to that dungeon. So, you still do the bribe, bribe step. Figure out where everyone's going. But then, now you get to hold them off for one turn. Um, which, yes, gives them an extra turn to like maybe tweak some stuff. Because they already got them there. Uh... But it could also mess them up if they, you know, it also give you another turn to mess with their cards or to draw another spell card or do something else. Um, or it just might give you potentially the chance to catch up on wings because maybe you have enough guys in yours. And then finally, we have zombie attack. Choose a dead hero in the opponent's scorekeeping area, send it back to the entrance of the dungeon until the end of turn it has plus two attack. Those are spell cards. Alright, then finally we have our heroes. We have epic heroes and we have regular heroes. Alright, so your heroes are sorted out like this. They're going to say ordinary hero and just have a name, cleric. Um, then they're going to have their type up top to help you out so you know which treasure type they're going towards. Their hit points. Their damage, which is always going to be one for every regular hero, um, at least in the base set. Um, there I have a symbol down here It's going to show a number. This is how many to include with that number of players. So I'm playing a two-player game. I'm going to include all the two players. If I'm playing a three-player, or so I'm playing a four-player game, I include this thief. But if I'm only playing a two-player game, I take this guy out. Um, and it's not necessary that those guys are harder. It's... Um, it's so like there's only X number of heroes in each thing. Because every time you play, you draw two card, like a card per hero. So if you put them all in a two-player game, if you put this entire deck in for a two-player game, you're never um, going to get through this deck and get to the epic heroes before one of you either dies or has ten souls. So they have it limited so that... Um, if you're playing about even, like each person getting defeating a hero here, defeating a hero there, and you're staying roughly even, um, you'll get into the epic heroes, and they'll kind of be like, oh, that's the f finale. Um, and that's why they just have them sorted out. Um, so realistically, you could, if you wanted to, pick and choose some of the different ones. Um, but since the only thing that matters is really their health, if you were going to swap out, like, for this guy that has three. Um, I would swap him for another hero that like. Like I'd swap him for like these two. Because they both have the same number of health. Just if you want a different picture character to look at. But it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't have any gameplay. Um, now there is a lot of lore on all these cards. And there's a lot of references to who these characters are. I don't know all of them. But we'll see what we can do. We have Nick the Masher. Uh, a young cleric was well armed and brave enough to take on the Dragon King himself. His credo, I bash it with my mace. Uh, Pugi the Druidus, the defender of the wilderness, now wields the power of nature. Flowers blossom in their footsteps, and life grows anew. Acacia, the warrior of light. Acacia is a terror free soul who makes her good her own luck. A strong defender of good, and she's undeterred even by the darkest of dungeons. And I don't think I don't think these ordinary ones are as referential as some of the way as the epic ones. I think the epic ones tend to be um, a lot more referential. Uh, Charles the Young. Charles has his mother's permission to go adventuring, but he has to return before sundown. Uh, Deltorius, the Angel of Light, created by the gods who like to defend Arcadia, which is what this world is called. Arcadia, it's like arcade games. So this kid angel never misses a shot with his enchanted crossbow. This is a reference to Pit uh, from the Pit games. Uh, Romeo, the Indigo Friar. 
He's a dedicated man of the cloth who wants to see the world coated in blue. You might actually think he's depressed, but he's actually very, very happy. Um, I don't know what this is a reference to, but I know it's a reference to something. And I may have to do a video sometime just trying to show off all the references, like comparing them to like what they're for. So we have Bowden the Pantsless. Uh, this is Ghosts and Gob Ghouls and Goblins. Bowden's courage is matched only by his forgetfulness. The quest continues. The quest to find his misplaced armor continues. Uh, Garrick, Squire of the Lion Knights. As a squire, Garrick loves nothing more than stories and legends. He has no idea that he would someday become one. Uh, Fire's Breath, the heroine of Arcadia. The scarlet-haired warrior woman known as Fire's Breath has pledged her deadly twin blades to the fight for liberty. Uh, this is probably Red Sonia. Samurai Tom. Not truly a samurai, this master was rolling seeks honor and glory. Johnny of the Evening Watch, a humble member of the Evening Watch whose Bango brothers is sworn to forsake the family and take the gray and clear dungeons. Uh, this guy, Jon Snow, I believe, from Game of Thrones. Uh, Crystal and Alan of Gurg. Bound by an unbreakable ring of Gerd, these lovers became the most dangerous husband and wife team in the adventuring business. Teague and the Magic Bubble, boying his magic bubble, which is an old video game. Armed with his trusty bubble, Teague braves a dangerous castle and the dungeons in search of a musical instrument stolen from his people. Uh, Mage, the... Uh, Brandork the Never Wrong. Schooled in seven flavors of magic, Brandork follows the teachings of Master Face, the Omniscient Celestial. Uh, Mitchell the Judge. He has wandered the plains, hopelessly lost, ever since his wife Nikki sent him to the store for diamond dust sugar. Uh, this is supposed to be, I think, based off of Jace. Uh, the Mind Sculptor from Magic the Gathering. Uh, Talish, Nine Fingers, the worst thief ever. Talish lost a finger and his freedom one night. Caught magic in prison by a search for cellmate. Now he kills evil with fire. Darkon, the elf pyromancer. Looks like a Final Fantasy character. Some elves just want to watch the world burn. Uh, Koei, the last dragon mage, the survivor, survivor of Draconia, vowed to save the world from Kirax range with the power bestowed him by the last emerald dragon. Uh, reminds me of like Green Lantern, kind of like the staff and the magical summoning. Um, I know that's probably not what it's for. Uh, Joe Man Chim, cut first. From the twinkle in his eye, you might think he comes back bearing gifts until you check your empty pockets. Lance Uppercut, Treasure Hunter. With a bent blade and a clenched fist, he gathers shining treasures from the glory of the Kinoish Empire. Jesta the Rogue. Okay, so you take the big guy on the left with the axe, I've got the two little ones on the right with the swords, and I'll take the dangerous looking treasure chest with no lock over there. That's funny. Uh, Sir Digby Apple, the ace detective. He battles to keep the coffers filling. To keep his partners pringing and to send needless message of power to all of the unwilling. Kings Kowalski, Mad Conquistador. It's hard for me to think about death, how insects and worms will eat me. I never think about death. I haven't even properly started to live yet. Uh, Jerome the Kung Fu Monkey. This could be based off so many different things. A visitor from a distant land. Hyperactive monkey studied martial arts under the legendary Sifu Wang. And then finally we have a unique interesting one. So he's the fool. He has no class type. The fool is lured to the dungeon player to few souls. 
So basically, he's going to stumble in and he's going to die because he only has two. So unless you draw him, like, on your first turn, um, he's probably going to lose. And even then, he might not. You might still be able to beat him depending on what you played. Now I have some epic ones. And now you can see the epic ones jump up. They give you two damage. There were two souls, so it really finishes off the game. So by the time you get them, you probably only need to get through one or two of them to be able to beat them. Um, although, it's nice because if like one player was falling behind, maybe they have to beat three or four of these guys to, to catch back up. But it's at least a potential they could do. Um, but they also have a lot higher health. I think like the highest ordinary hero is eight. All right, we have twos, eights fours and sixes so all even numbers and then now when we get to these guys we have all odd numbers i believe 11s 13s it's like 11s and 13s there might be a, another 15 or something in there but yeah so it really ramps that number up so we have caitlin the angelic healer among the most exalted defenders of righteousness caitlin is sometimes referred to as Alcasima Luce, highest light. And yeah, I'm not sure that's specifically for. Uh, Kirabros Dirtbeard, Canine Cleric, half hailing from the Highlands. The squee button friar never turns down a fetch quest. Because he's a dog. Uh, Lord Vanette, a prophet, and collected the tithes for the Om, Om, Omniscient Celestial. His miracles are enhanced by the Braguing distilled by the monks of the Nithing. Ugh, that's a mouthful. Jejun and Everlea, the Holy Sisters, tenacious and vivacious, each is a threat on her own, but woe betide any who would stand against the sisters' united power. Got some fighters. We have Frank off the envoy. Uh, this brave warrior stands alone against evil that rules the world. Uh, he also reminds me of a dungeon, not dungeon, double dragon character. Uh, Nate, the Squid Slayer. This surly warrior defeated the mighty Squib, Lord of the Rock to Pie. Now he seeks to destroy King Croak himself. A little bit of war there. Um, Antonius, the Ruin Knight. An elite dragoon, Sir Tony. Antonia, Sir Tony, wears armor inscribed with magic ruins of ancient and mysterious power. So I wonder if this is somewhat of a reference to Iron Man. Very loose reference. Asmar the Aulus. With Asmar lacking technical acuity, he more than makes up for impulsiveness. There's no door he won't kick down, much to the frustration of Arcadia's innkeepers. Uh, Tempros the Time Marauder. He would use his control over time to end all crime. In his hands, the world would be a utopia. Chai Kang, mystical warlock of you. Hey, listen. I think this boss monster is Silage Berry. I will crush him through the fire and flame in the name of the Order. Uh, oh, I wonder if that's, uh... I wonder if like the sunglasses it, and Zelda kind of mixed with like uh, the Matrix in a set, sort of like hey it's fake he's like nah I can take him I'm the one um, Carrick Warhelm half elf archmage weakened by the evil curse this once mighty warrior donned red robes and turned to magic his spell is channeled through the magical helm of untold power Uh, Wayward the Drifter. He's a traveler from a strange land. His only goal is to do whatever, whatever is right, whatever that means. Uh, Haya, the legendary shinobi. Uh, Arcadia's deadliest ninja. Haya abides by the proverb that revenge is a, is a dish best served cold. Uh, this would be shinobi, video game. Uh, Blackbeard Jake. Blackbeard the pirate. Uh, he had all this treasure he won from insult, sword fighting, and a booty filled trap on the cave of the coast of a town called Astoria. 
Uh, we have Cecil Learon, the Master Fractorium. The ultimate jack of all trades, Cecil isn't above taking mercenary work to earn gold and glory, but his real goal has never changed, to find a way to return his betrothed Nevera, sealed in a rapier, to her original form. And then finally we have Walbang Basket Weaver, uh, which is obviously a Hobbit reference. Uh, this humble halfling would rather spend his days weaving baskets and eating crumbly cookies. When the adventure calls, he proves a first-rate burglar. Alright, so that is what we got for Boss Monster the Base Game. Uh, check out the other, check out the gameplay video so you think of how the game plays. Um, check out the uh, other videos I'm going to do. I'll probably try and do another gameplay video eventually with some of the updated expansions just because there will be um, item cards that affect the heroes and some mini bosses in the later sets. Uh, so see you guys later. Bye.